but there's some over there. All right, thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Beautiful day out there today, day after the election, post-election day. I've got two things to talk with you about today, and then, of course, we're going to take your questions. Uh, I think we'll, we'll uh, mix it up a little bit today, and first thing we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about the election yesterday. And, uh, and then we'll go on and talk about COVID and then, then take your questions. So first of all, let me just say thank you to all of the folks who worked the polls yesterday, who worked at the election board. I was out and about at a number of polling places yesterday, just uh, chatting with people and seeing how everybody was doing. And um, there were a lot more poll workers out yesterday than I have seen in previous elections. They were helping folks uh, stay in line. They were helping folks be socially distanced. They were calling people into the polling place uh, one by one by precinct. This has not happened. It happened in August a bit, but this has not happened um, in prior elections. And I just think it made for a safe uh, and, and convenient voting experience for all of those who voted in person yesterday. So I just want to say Thank you to the election board for really going above and beyond and, and having all the poll workers and the election workers there. Uh, in addition to that, some of you have, may have seen that we had a number of uh, people who were voting from their car at the election board downtown, and those were folks who were COVID positive or who had been, uh, who were being quarantined. And our election board still figured out how to vote those people from their car. The election board folks, if you didn't see the pictures uh, in the paper, they were uh, completely covered with gowns and, and masks and face shields and goggles so that they could be sure to stay safe. But honestly, that is really um, above and beyond. And, and I just want to congratulate the election board on a, a really good job with this election. The other thing I want to talk about a little bit is um, of course, we're all waiting on what, what's the result of the presidential election. Be patient. Every vote needs to count. And that's, that's really where we are today. And, and as much uh, as anxious as everyone is to know the answer, um, we've got to be patient and wait. Uh, we don't have any choice, of course, but just trying to say, be patient, take a, take a breath, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll know as We'll know as soon as the, uh, these half a dozen states have their final results. Um, I also want to say congratulations to our new Congresswoman, Cori Bush, who sealed it yesterday. Um, of course, she won in the primary in August, but it's not done until it's done. And uh, so congratulations, Cori Bush, on being the new first district congressman, Congresswoman. And uh, I look forward to working with you. Our relationships with our federal delegation are so important and um, they're important so that we can get what we need for the residents of st louis's and st louis and the businesses of st louis and so of course we uh we look forward to working with corey bush <clears throat> one of the things i would say about yesterday is that um, i thought the voter turnout would be higher it was 65% of the registered voters voted yesterday. But I went back and looked at, at a little bit of history. And this is interesting, I think. Almost the exact number of people voted yesterday in the city of St. Louis as voted four years ago in the city of St. Louis. So uh, within a couple of hundred. So the voter turnout, while I, I always want it to be more, it was 65% yesterday of the registered voters. We also know that it's possible that a lot of those registered voters, you know, could have moved or folks, folks move around and rarely does anyone take their name off of the voter registration. So every few years, um, those uh, voter registrations are, are, are cleaned up, and you certainly don't want to do it too soon. So exact number of votes cast yesterday was 
132,840 in the city of St. Louis. Uh, four years ago, almost the exact same number. So, always wanted to be more, but um, predictable, I think, voter, voter turnout yesterday. So, yesterday, the city of St. Louis, there were several uh, propositions on the ballot. And just in case you haven't heard the results of a couple of these, one is there was a, a proposition on the ballot as to whether or not the city could hire people who lived in St. Louis County, for example, or who live somewhere else uh, and, and allow them to work for the city while living somewhere else. And we call that lifting the residency requirement. The vote count on that was almost exactly 50-50 literally within a couple of hundred votes. So 50% of the people thought we should be able to hire people who live outside of the city boundaries and 50% thought we should not. Um, but it didn't pass because that would have been a charter amendment and it takes 60% of the vote to pass a charter amendment. So um, that did not pass. Folks uh, other than public safety officers police officers, firefighters, EMS, uh, everyone else uh, who is hired by the city of St. Louis will have to live in the city of St. Louis. Um, so that, that did not pass yesterday. The, thing that, the big thing that did pass yesterday was something called approval voting. This is going to be very interesting for St. Louis. Uh, it's only done at one other place in the whole country, and that's in Fargo, uh, South Dakota, North, yeah. North Dakota. Uh, one of the Dakotas. So it's only done in one other place. Uh, and what it means is that, one, to run for mayor, comptroller, president of the board of aldermen, or alderman, uh, you will not declare a party. So it'll be nonpartisan. I think it's very interesting. I, I thought in this campaign it was very interesting to see all the, all the Democratic organizations, several of them, who were in favor of not having Democrats anymore on the ballot. That was interesting to me. But the biggest change in this is that in March, when you go to the polls to vote for your alderman or vote for mayor or vote for comptroller in March, if there are five people on the ballot, you can vote for all five of them, or you can vote for two of them, or you can vote for one of them. You can vote for as many candidates as you want in the primary. Now, I, I think that's very confusing for people. And it, it's, it's, it'll be interesting because I think that's going to be hard for people to understand. What do you mean? I can vote for three out of the five people or seven out of the ten people? You know, last time in the mayoral's election, there were ten people that were running for mayor. And so they would have all been on the ballot. At, was it ten or was it twelve? I think it was ten. Um, seven Democrats, three Republicans, but they'll all be on one ballot together, no party indication. So if there are 10 people again, you'll be able to vote for all 10 of them if you, if you want to. Then in April, you'll, we'll have a runoff election of whoever the top two vote getters are, re regardless of party, because you won't know their party. That won't be on the ballot. <clears throat> so that's going to be interesting for St. Louis. Uh, we will be uh, the guinea pigs for this, for in, in terms of a major city in our country, for this kind of voting, um, and and I hope it, I hope it works out well. Um, I, I think it's going to be very confusing for the public. But that's what we voted on yesterday, and it passed, by the way, overwhelmingly. Uh, Seventy-five percent, I think, was the number of people who voted in favor of that. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Um, <clears throat> So that's, that's it on the elections for today. We could talk about that longer, but um, you know, I think just as an update, that uh, election is almost over. We're waiting for some results, but um, thanks for indulging me on that. Now, on to talking about COVID. Oh gosh. Our COVID numbers, the numbers in the region are really not good. Um, we had a pandemic task, ta pandemic task force call yesterday afternoon, which we do every Tuesday afternoon, and sometimes we talk more often than that. Uh, let me give you a few of the numbers, and then let's just try to talk about 
what we can do about this. So right now, the city of St. Louis is averaging 78 cases, new cases, new positive cases a day. Uh, one month ago, on October the 4th, we were averaging 31. So that's almost a 150% increase in the last 30 days in terms of new cases. People in the hospital in the region, because of course our hospitals serve the region and beyond. Yesterday there were 150 people. It's lags two days behind, so that's a Monday number. Uh, 150 people in the hospital, COVID positive. Another 103 people were in the hospital who were suspected of having COVID, but they hadn't tested positive yet. A month ago, 229 people were in the hospital COVID positive. So the number of people in the hospital with, that are confirmed COVID positive has almost doubled in the last 30 days. And I guess it's to be expected. The, when you have more and more cases and you have more and more spread, of course, eventually more and more people will be in the hospital. Uh, the city of St. Louis numbers um, are not good, but I will tell you that they are better per capita than the areas around us. So <clears throat> while if you're a city resident, thank you for following the uh, mask mandate, thank you for keeping your social distance, uh, washing your hands, and most importantly, for keeping your groups small. Um, so 450 people in the hospital yesterday, 110 were in the ICU, and uh, hang on here, 59 were on ventilators. Uh, the only little bit of bright spot here is that a month ago, 48 people were on ventilators. So there are more, but um, not, not as much more as there are people in the hospital. So these numbers are very, very sobering. And um, we are, as, as a region, uh, I'll, I'll tell you that <clears throat> one of the physicians on the pandemic task force yesterday said we either have to get compliance with the mask mandate and keeping your groups small, or we're going to end up in another lockdown. I don't wanna do that. I know you don't wanna do that. If we have to do that, that will put more people out of work. Um, that will put more people under extreme stress. So this little thing you know, called wearing a mask, and I happen to have, I got a, a new mask from Soulard neighborhood this past weekend very, very cute and uh, promotes Soulard. So while, while I'm, I'm making a little bit of fun, having a little fun with the Soulard's new mask, such a serious topic. And if, if we won't do it, and when I say we, I mean the big we, I know most of you probably are doing it, but um, if, we, if we won't do that, we are, um, according to this doctor, going to end up in another lockdown, in another shutdown, in another stay-at-home order, call it whatever you want. So that is the seriousness of this. I know that city businesses are working very hard to be in compliance. Our health department is following up on anybody that they are aware of that's not in compliance and, and really to follow up to just say, hey, you guys, you know, you've got to make sure your employees wear masks. You've got to make sure you're your customers, your patrons wear masks. So it's a very serious situation. Um, Missouri is one of, I think, only five states that does not have a statewide mask mandate at this time. And I understand, I really do understand that many people, we don't like to be told what to do. Um, but it's the only thing we have to combat this raging virus that we have and that is to modify our own behavior. So I ask you to do that. I bring up to you that likely by the end of this week, we'll continue to see an uptick in our cases, number of cases, because of the social activities that happened over Halloween. 
Uh, and these didn't have to be big events. These, these were just, you know, 8, 10, 12, 15 people maybe getting together. Uh, and here we are headed into Thanksgiving where um, hopefully you are uh, going to be celebrating Thanksgiving this year with just your immediate family. Um, I, I know that's difficult. It's difficult in our family as well. But we are just going to be celebrating with, with, uh, our, with ourselves, our immediate family. And while normally we would be um, getting together uh, with my family, usually the weekend before Thanksgiving, and that's a big group. My husband's family would normally come to our house on Thanksgiving or often, and we would all have a great time. We'd eat too much. We'd eat pie. We would sing songs and, you know, sit around and, and talk about family stuff. But it really is quite, um, quite risky to do that this year. So those are the only two subjects that I wanted to visit with you about today. But, of course... I'll take your questions. A couple of questions, Mayor, starting with the <coughs> election first. You talk about some of the props. Props are also cast in the city. Some mm -hmm. folks have asked about how, uh, what kind of impact that's going to have on kids and child care, especially during COVID-19. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, Prop R is a six cent, six cent increase in your property taxes. And so for a house uh, that's worth $100,000, that's about $11 a year. The house that's worth $200,000, that's about $22 a year. So that will uh, provide additional funding for early childhood education, uh, ed, uh, child care and childhood education for kids five and under. So I think, you know, that will begin being collected not until the end of next year because your property tax bill for, that's due this December 31st. It's already been mailed. You probably already have it. Um, we already we already know what that is. So it's too late now to get it on this year's property tax bill. But a year from now, it will be on your property tax bill, and it'll be after that that we'll begin seeing the impact uh, and and additional funding for early childhood education. Joe's question, Mayor: Will you be running for a second term? Joe, Joe, who? <laughs> no, no, it's I'm, I'm kidding. You know, we've talked about that before, Joe. Uh, and yes. Absolutely. Uh, do you, we have a second question about Prop B. Do, do you support it? And what kind of impact do you think it will have on the race in the spring? Well, I talked about that already. But um, I was not a supporter of Prop D. But let me say this. Our voters passed at 75%. So I think it... Uh, we will be, uh, we'll, City of St. Louis will be the guinea pig to see how a big city implements something called approval voting. And um, we'll all try to figure it out. All voters will, will need to do a lot of educational campaign, but because if there are 10 people that are running for mayor, like there were last time, you can vote for eight of them, or you can vote for nine of them, or you can vote for three of them, and then there'll be a runoff. Also, you will not know whether the person is a Democrat or Republican because that will not be on the ballot. I mean, they might tell you that, but not running in a partisan election. So, uh, so we'll see. Uh, last election question. This has to do with the presidential race that remains undecided. Chris's question has to do with um, what are the plans to ensure um, safe and possible peaceful demonstrations regardless of the outcome? Mm -hmm. of what happens is the city preparing for protests uh, we are Chris although last night there was a, a group of maybe I don't know 75 or 100 people I'm, I'm not sure exactly how many were there that were downtown that um, were really just they, they had a screen uh, or something they were using as a screen I think they were watching election results um, and so it, it was um, a very calm, I guess would be the word I would use, group, group of folks. Everybody is anxious about the outcome of the election. That's true no matter who you're in favor of. Uh, City of St. Louis, by the way, voted very strongly in favor of Joe Biden. And I'll give you the numbers here. 
So 82% of the votes cast in the city of St. Louis, just the city, were cast for Biden-Harris. So um, this evening, there's another protest planned at 5 o'clock. I think there's one planned for tomorrow night at 5 o'clock. Um, we're very hopeful that that will be um, uh, a very calm demonstration. But we are always prepared um, in the event that, um, that it, it does turn violent. So yes, we're prepared. Rutherford questions are COVID and CARES Act stuff, Mayor. Uh, Jamie's question has to do with, do you plan on moving restaurants and bars to carry out and delivery curbside only to start decreasing community spread like you previously did? We may have to do that. That uh, We've not made that decision yet. Um, there would probably be a lot of other things that went along with that decision. What we're finding, and I, we talked about this on Monday, is that there's no, we don't know for sure, and we don't think that it's necessarily spreading in bars and restaurants because bars and restaurants, their occupancy is already down at 50%. We're already recommending that people do outdoor dining, that they do carry out. Um, and so, I mean, it's possible that that has to happen, but we haven't made that decision yet. Mary would like to know the status of the major roads in our five parks. Are they closed still, and when will they reopen, if they are going to reopen? Mary, a few roads are closed in the major parks, not all of them. And that's so that people can get outside, enjoy the parks, meaning bikers, walkers. Uh, and frankly, most people are uh, like having those, those few roads closed and having the parks be more about park activities than about driving. So I don't expect that we're gonna change that anytime soon. Lindsay's question is, what is being done to protect school staff, public school staff, she writes, and students, keep them safe as COVID cases continue to rise in the city? Well, as we heard last week from Dr. Eccles, he was on, I think last Monday maybe, um, <clears throat> their schools it is not spreading in schools any more than than anywhere else and so dr eccles has worked extensively with our schools on infection control procedures on social distancing on mask wearing uh, as long as that holds which which it's holding at this point in time we think it's very important for kids to be in school not everyone's back in school full time yet but many kids are in school. And as you know, started with the younger kids um, who have, a, a, a friend of mine told me a story the other day and he, uh, he, he went over to see his grandkids. His grandkids are like, I don't know, maybe sixth grade and first grade. And so he knocked on his granddaughter's room. She was during school time and she was, he cracks the door open and she's in there very intent on her computer, being very actively engaged in school. He knocked on the little boy's door and he saw the computer was on. He looked in the room and um, the little boy was had under the covers uh, with his new, with their dog, okay? So I tell you this story only because I think it, you know, little kids are much more difficult for them to maintain that attention span on a computer screen. So important that our kids stay in school, if at all possible. We want to keep the kids safe, we want to keep teachers safe, we want to keep staff safe, um, all of which requires uh, a lot of additional uh, mask wearing, social distancing, and all those kinds of things. But Okay, last three questions all have to do with care Act. Emily's question is, um, you recently got additional money for small businesses and assistance. Will a business that already received CARES Act grant the first time around be eligible again to apply for new funding that's been approved? If you have already gotten a $5,000 grant, at least initially you would not be able to get another one. So we that actually that money is actually just voted on this about three hours ago this morning at the board of ENA we allocated another one million two hundred and fifty thousand 
to go to small businesses uh, to help them out through this pandemic, and especially with a focus on small businesses that are in the hospitality, uh, you know, hotels, restaurants, uh, industry. So um, we'll be rolling that out soon. We had to wait to see if the Board of uh, Estimate and Apportionment would pass it this morning. So you'll be hearing more about that soon. Uh, Cynthia's question has to do with um, landlords. Uh, when will more landlords begin to receive CARES funds if their tenants have filled out their rental assistance applications? So <clears throat> we have received over 7,000 applications from tenants for CARES for rental assistance. Um, that tenant has to provide the paperwork and that landlord has to provide the information necessary for us to actually cut the rent check from the CARES Act funding to the landlord. Checks are being cut every week through every agency. So first of all, if you're a landlord, it sounds like you might be asking for a landlord. If you're a landlord, we'll make sure your tenant has applied. And if your tenant has applied, it ha they're not paying the rent has to be due to them being laid off or reduction of hours because of COVID or not being able to get a job because of COVID. And it's up to three months rent. You do have to, um, many do have to enter into a mediation, you know, try to get this worked out uh, sort of situation. But yes, people are, landlords are being paid every day. Christina's question, last one of the day. How is the city using its CARES Act allocation to get ready for winter to house uh, members of the unhoused community? Christina, we have, and you, you, if you're a regular viewer, you know this, but we have um, either spent or will be spending millions and millions of dollars to add additional beds to our, um, to the beds available for homeless individuals for PPE, for um, rental assistance, permanent supportive housing, for utility assistance, it's over $20 million. So we're spending a lot of money to try to help people get off the street and stay off the street. You know not everyone wants to go, uh, but as it's getting colder, and so we really will be um, trying to get those folks off the feet. We have off the street. We have a lot of partners that are working with us on that. Very difficult situation. I will just tell you that the that the regular shelters have all cut their population in half, sometimes more. So if they took care of um, I don't know, 100 people last year, they're taking care of 50 people this year. That's causing a strain. And they just don't have the volunteers, and they don't have the employees. A lot of their volunteers and their employees are unwilling to work in a COVID pandemic environment uh, because they might have underlying health conditions. They might be older and, and they don't want that exposure. I, you know, I understand that. So very tough situation, but we are spending millions and millions of dollars. That's it for today. Thank you all. Thanks for being with us today. Beautiful day out there. I think we've got a few more days like this. I hope you get out and enjoy them. Um, thanks for being with us.